Tonight on Nation to Nation, columnist Doug Cuthand explains why he wrote that First Nations struggled after signing treaties in the Western provinces. We were left out of, really woefully left out of, was the economy. We uh, didn't get a chance to develop our land. We didn't get a chance to farm it. A political scientist grades the federal government's performance on its relationship uh, with Indigenous Harris, people over the past year. The Crown is going to still do what it wants, irrespective of what we think um, and what our territorial title and rights mean to them. And a First Nations leader hopes a deal cut with the feds to fish during the commercial season pans out. Our community members, you know, they, they want to make a moderate livelihood, moderate living uh, to, to, to help their families. Ani, welcome to Nation to Nation. I'm Annette Francis. Treaties signed with First Nations across the country have long been an issue of contention. What was meant to be an agreement of trust, sharing and benefits for all parties didn't always turn out that way. Doug Cuthand is a columnist for the Saskatoon Star Phoenix. His latest column is titled First Nations People Struggled Under Farming Treaties. He joins us now to talk about it. Welcome. Thanks. Nice to be here. So what do you mean when you describe the treaties signed largely on the prairies in the 19th century as farming treaties? They weren't really farming treaties. They were sort of peace and friendship. And then there was a agreement that we would work together and we would uh, build an economy. And so one of the largest uh, framed pieces of the, of the treaty was the farming clause in which uh, it guarantees everybody who wants to start farming will get like a hoe and a rake and a pitchfork and a whole bunch of stuff like that. And uh, the band would be eligible for a team of oxen and some horses and, and a, a boar and piglets and all kinds of stuff like It's very detailed. It's kind of funny to read because it's all written in 1876. And uh, times have changed, of course, and uh, a team of oxen might well translate into a a modern four-wheel drive tractor today, so it's um, it, it it was never upgraded. It was very poorly implemented, if at all, and uh, so uh, we now have a, a settlement where um, it's called plows, plows and cows, where we're getting uh, a cash compensation for the failure for the government to implement this treat this part of the treaty. So what more is needed in order for those treaties to, to get a, a modern update? We uh, didn't get a chance to develop our land. We didn't get a chance to farm it. Uh, in some places, some reserves have, have uh, cattle ranches, and they were our people were more suited to, to ranching than they were to farming. So there was a, there was a, some of that was done, but basically our people were held back. There was legislation to keep us on the reserves. So if you can't sell your produce, you can't, you know, what's the point of farming? And uh, there, were, there, were, there was a lot of uh, other, you know, things just put in our way. We, we were, there was a thing called peasant farming, for example, where they thought that we had to evolve. We couldn't just start out as regular farmers. So we had to work with hoes and rakes and scythes and sickles and so on to, to till the land. It was ridiculous. Meanwhile, they, you know, modern, modern equipment, uh, such as it was back in the day, was starting to, to break the land and this sort of thing, but our people weren't, weren't allowed to. So all of this talk of reconciliation from the federal government in a step uh, honoring the original intent, intent of the treaties is, oh, sorry. Is all this talk of reconciliation from the federal government a step in honoring the original t intent of the treaties? Well, there's a lot of talk of reconciliation, but that's what it is. It's just talk. There's been very little real substance put on the, the you know, any meat on these bones kind of thing. Uh, what we have to do is uh, look back at the spirit and intent of the treaties themselves. And this is all the, tre all the number of treaties across the prairies. We were told that we were going to benefit from it. And we were told we were going to work together. We were going to share the land. There's all this kind of good talk. And instead, we were restricted to our reserves. So if we're going to share the land, that means we've got a right to share the resources. We've got a right to, to you know, access new land. For example, the uh, 
uh, PFRA pastures are being sold off here in Saskatchewan, and our people aren't getting any chance to bid on them or get get them at all. They're just going to uh, uh, white co-ops and, and settlers and ranchers. So, and the same thing with all the look at all the minerals that have been taken out of this land. We haven't received anything in terms of revenue sharing. Uh, if we had, we wouldn't be poor today. We'd have a uh, we'd have we'd have an economy. We'd have uh, resources and um, infrastructure on our reserves, that type of thing. Instead, our band councils live from year to year, budget to budget, basically just enough to keep them alive. Whereas if we were to share this land equitably, we'd be in much better shape. So yeah, there's a lot that they could do for the treaties. And the first one is open it up and really share seriously. On another note, this week is the 150th anniversary of the creation of the Northwest Mounted Police, later known as the RCMP historically. What was the relationship like with this force? Uh, to begin with, it was quite good. Uh, we, uh, the, the, the RCMP or the Northwest Mounted Police, uh, the story is they were brought, uh, they were put in place because of the Americans uh, massacre at uh, Cypress Hills. But more realistically, they were brought in as a way of declaring sovereignty over the prairies because the Americans wanted to move north. The Americans were ready to, to claim all of Western North America. So by, by putting a police force in and making treaty with the First Nations, they established sovereignty of the, of the prairies. So at the first, there, were, there was a lot of goodwill between the Northwest Mounted Police and the... Uh, uh, First Nations people, because basically there was nobody else out here. There was a police force, and there was us, and that was uh, uh, and uh, that was a relationship. Uh, also, the uh, we have a, when we have tree payment, the uh, police will show up in their red surge, and they will uh, the, the money is given from the Indian agent to the RCMP, and then it's passed on to us. And the RCMP or the Northwest Mounted Police were like a bridge. They were between the government and us. They were the, they were the seen as the protectors and this sort of thing. Where things got got hairy was when the settlement began and the Northwest Mounted Police began implementing or they had to uh, enforce a lot of government policy that was very negative. Uh, they fought the RCMP didn't want to enforce. The pass system, for example, because it wasn't legal. It was just simply a, a policy by the government. On the other hand, though, the police were obl obliged to go with the priests and uh, Indian agent and collect children for residential school. So, you know, th th there's a bad taste in our mouth over that. Do you, do you think that it's too late to improve the image of the RCMP? No, I don't think it's too late. I don't think it's, I don't think anything is ever too late. We can't just throw out the baby with the bathwater here. There is there is a lot that the RCMP could be doing, but they have to be trained uh, better, and they have to have more cross cultural training. They have to understand our culture. Uh, they have to understand our people. Uh, they you know um, our, our people will protect each other to the point of lying to the police and. Uh, you know, we, we stick together, and uh, uh, so it's, it's, it's a very different thing. Uh, can I have time for one example? The RCMP uh, used to just uh, bring a new recruit out to the community, and they'd point out that this, this guy, his kids are thieves, that's the bootlegger, this guy beats his wife, and so on and so forth. So the new recruit would get nothing but the worst image of the community. Now, what they, what they do nowadays, or they, what they're supposed to do, is bring a new recruit out and put him into the band office and let the band council take care of him. So they'll take him around. They'll take him to the school, introduce him to the kids, take him to some of the elders' homes, some of the leaders, some of the you know leading people in the community, like school committee members and so on. And that gives the RCMP a completely different view of the community, and he'll take ownership. He won't be seen as an outside force. He'll take ownership and look after the people. And that's really what we need. Okay. Miigwech, thank you for this. Uh-huh. Much does. After the break, political scientist Veldon Coburn joins us to grade the government this past season.
welcome back. This is our final show of the season and we thought it was time to look back at how well the nation to nation relationship worked out this past year. For example, have there been positive steps towards true reconciliation between the government and Indigenous people? To give his thoughts on this, we're now joined by political scientist Veldon Colburn. He's an Anishinaabe and teaches at the University of Ottawa. Welcome, Professor Colburn. Hi, Annette. How are you? Great. So in this past session, how would you rate the performance by the federal government when dealing with Indigenous peoples? Well, it'll be a long time before I start giving them much of a passing grade, but it's still, it's still a, a fairly low. Uh, in the last year, I would say for this parliamentary session, which is just rising for the summer, uh, I, you know, Indigenous peoples took a little bit more of a back seat. Uh, we're always in the back seat, but it didn't seem like we really registered much. Uh, in terms of reconciliation, well, Crown Indigenous Relations uh, Minister Mark Miller, who had been rolling out dollars for uh, communities to begin a ground pen penetrating radar for residential schools that are, are nearby or where some of our loved ones and family members had attended. So th there's that, but in terms of uh, huge landmarks, there was still a little bit of a struggle too, because uh, with Cindy Blackstock's case, is fighting the full sort of recognition of those who are entitled to settlements. So it, again, a little bit of a sore spot to leave this year. Um, a lot left to be desired for sure. What do you see as their biggest accomplishment? For, for the Crown, not much really. They did, I guess, still kind of drag their feet. Although, um, as, as I mentioned, getting to the $40 billion settlement and ironing out the details, they did try to cut a few corners and, and uh, Cindy Blackstock had to, to fight to continue to get them to honor their word. So I think that's still a landmark in, and high watermark because it does rectify quite a bit and it's, it's a massive step forward, largest, I think, uh, settlement with the government in Canadian history. And so, yeah, that that might be one reason, if, if if anything, because it's 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 not a really a reason to celebrate because of the uh, the trauma and um, the damage that that those dollars go to, you know, only really patch over its its families and children that have been torn apart, um, and uh, it's not something I guess we would celebrate ourselves, but. We, we got there and um, again, all credit to Sydney Blackstock for over 15 years of fighting for this. And um, yeah, I think I, I would attribute it to that. Mm -hmm. What about uh, other disappointments? Are, what, what other things are you seeing? Oh, well, you know, you still see sort of Neskatanga for uh, boil, li living on a, like a no consumption boil water, drinking water advisory after 25 years. Um, out west, there's still plans, and this is largely, again, with the provincial crowns themselves, um, plowing through wet so it's in territory news that's coming out just showing that uh, the territory and going through salmon beds across British Columbia for laying down pipeline without the consent. So when you talk about Crown Indigenous relations and that nation to nation relation, it's uh, we're still often ignored. And I think those are, I guess, examples that uh, show that the Crown is going to still do what it wants, irrespective of what we think um, and what our territorial title and rights mean to them so how would you characterize the jobs indigenous services minister patty Heidi and crown indigenous relations minister mark miller have done uh well i to his credit i always say that uh minister mark miller has accomplished more during his time and prior to this he was uh in patty Heidi's position as minister of indigenous services canada uh, in the previous government's uh but now as crown indigenous relations minister he's accomplished more than all indigenous ministers or the indian agent as it were uh combined so 
you see these large amounts of funding that have flow, flowed in and it's, uh, it, it can kind of boggle the mind of the accomplishments that he's made. Again, it does fall short, but he's, again, done more than anyone else prior even combined. So uh, my hat's off to him. Still a lot more work to do, especially when it comes to honoring the words of, I guess, treaties and that true nation to nation spirit where it means title and rights for indigenous peoples rather than coming back as we see with large amounts of dollars to put a band-aid over the harm that had been caused over the last couple centuries because there are still ongoing harms that need to be rectified. What should be the priority when they return in the fall parliament? Oh, yeah, there's there's so many too. Uh, still addressing drinking water. That's there. They do point to quite a bit of progress that's been made, but it seems that in, in, in many cases that it's stalled, that there's a lot of hard work still ahead because when they addressed uh, many of them, it was the low hanging fruit. So the easiest cases that had been addressed through um, smaller investments of capital and training workers to um, to bring system ups, systems, uh, so water and wastewater treatment systems in communities up to operational standards. And yet the uh, the most difficult, as I mentioned, uh, say Nascataga still, still needs to be addressed. So basic living conditions for indigenous peoples, we're still very far behind. There's gaps in so many areas of socioeconomic indicators such as education and health. Um, those always remain a priority. Governance for sure, that again still leaves a lot to be desired. Okay, miigwech, thank you for joining us. Miigwech Annette. After the break, Eskasoni Chief Leroy Denny talks about a development in his community's moderate livelihood fishery. Welcome back. Could there be peace on Nova Scotia waters over catching lobster? The province's largest First Nation, Eskasoni, agreed to an MOU with the Department of Fisheries and Oceans recently. It joins two other Cape Breton Mi'kmaq First Nations taking part in a moderate livelihood lobster fishery. The MOU with the federal government will allow over 4,000 traps to be set during the commercial season. Eskasoni Chief Leroy Denny joins us now to talk about what this means. Welcome to Nation to Nation. Great morning. So why did your community come to this in term of understanding with the DFO? How will it help? Um, this will help, uh, first of all, to have a, a Mi'kmaq-led uh, management plan uh, developed by uh, by our fishers and uh you know to uh, to work with the dfo to uh you know to help us um you know past four years we've been developing this plan and there has been a lot of uh um, issues and challenges but uh finally you know um you know these, these few years we're working with the plan we're working with our fishers to finally find a, a way forward and uh to develop this plan and have uh, uh, with DFO and uh, so our harvesters from um, not just Eskazoni but the three the three communities uh, uh, Wegoma and uh, and Mudlode, uh to have to work with the uh, the fishing community here to find we work with the, uh, the fishing community along with um, for safety for uh, conservation science uh, purposes and and uh, hoping that in, in the future we'll find a, a unity amongst our this fishing community because uh you know we're not going anywhere at all and it's really important we start to uh fish side by side and and fish um and for all of us to work together and that's the main goal here have any fishermen from your community experienced harassment or gear damage from harvesting from harvesting yes. lobster under the under the uh, moderate livelihood fishery well this plan 
uh, you know, we just uh, had under it's not signed. It's not a sign plan. It's more like a under a mutual, uh, a mutual respectful um, management plan was developed by our fishers and and uh, working with uh, with DFO to for them to understand as the courts told them, you know, twenty four years ago. That they need to uh, make room for the the treaty right protected fishery here, and um, so it's there has been from many many harassments over the years, harassments by the DFO, by local fishers, you know, traps being um, you know taken and sank and and death threats and being shot at and all all these things happening. It's you know it, those things have to stop. We need to. Uh, the industry have to understand and respect our, our our treaty rights, and and I think, you know, um, and have a more welcoming place because this is an industry that we need to really work together, you know, and, and um, so it's starting to um, happen now slowly, you know, uh, and and we're tired of it, but we're not stopping. Our fishers have been very patient, and we're working the leadership working really hard to make sure the DFO and and the the RCMP to and, and to help protect our fishers, you know, they're just our community members, you know, they, they want to make a moderate livelihood, moderate living uh, to 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 help their families to, you know, make a modest living amongst um for themselves, for their families. And, and that's what's happening under the, the treaty uh, based uh, fishery. Do you feel this is strengthening or upholding treaty rights? Well, while we may, may not agree on every aspect of our uh, respective vision of livelihood fishery, Nigamagi through the DFO, uh, but we will continue to make that process. And uh, as long as we continue talking and you know and address these issues, like um, like most recently, we we're able to come to a mutual understanding with DFO on our Kunamagi um, Nedugulim. Kunamagi means Cape Breton Nedugulim Treaty Right Protected Fisheries Plan and. These understandings may be, um, you know, interim measures for now, but we will continue to push for long-term plans to the uh, co-management of the the resources in our territory. So this is a great start, really. And um, um, again, we're not satisfied the numbers of traps yet, and you know, uh, and still like we're just uh, starting to uh, uh, be more positive now and. Uh, and it start, it's starting to, after four years, it's been, you know, every year it was a struggle and very challenging. But at least now we have something in writing now and and, and it has a mutual understanding. It's not in the sign as of yet, but uh, the DFO received notice and um, they, they, really, they received notice to work with them. And uh, this is a, a change in the working uh, process. Okay. Miigwech. Thank you for this, Chief. Hello, Miigwech. That's it for Nation to Nation for this season. See you again in October. And if you missed any parts of tonight's show, you can catch out our podcast. Go to aptnnews.ca slash podcast. Miigwech. Miigwech.